Wow. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome to St. Mary on this beautiful island of Jamaica. I trust you can hear me well. I think so. <laughs> Gail, Gail, you are astute. Yes, I'm upstairs. <laughs> and you all see that the place is not totally finished. However, uh, we don't even have paint behind me. Totally, um, the, the foundation paint um, is not yet on <coughs> me, in every place. But I believe that I could show you how things are in transition in all of our lives and we are developing ourselves. Amen. So this morning we have an opportunity to see. Behind me is the sea. You can see the sea out here. Um, beautiful, beautiful sea. And uh, then the sun is coming up, bright um, sunshine. I don't know if I can show you, if I can just turn. Well, no, you can't really see that right now. But beautiful, beautiful sunshine coming up out there. Probably good you can't see it if you're blind with the camera. But um, again, good morning. This is Morning Prayer Live, and I am Bishop Winston Watson, coming to you here from the island of Jamaica. I want to encourage you to join us each morning. Join us each morning at 6 a.m. coming to you live. Amen. Each morning we come, we give you a word, we give you a prophetic utterance, we give you something that carries you throughout that day and sometimes carries you beyond that day, amen? Because the Lord would have you know um, that He loves you, He cares for you, and He strengthens you. If you want to be a partner with us, always, you know, we invite you to be um, a part of Acts Mission Jamaica. And you can partner through your giving, your, that is your, your financial support. That's always been available online. We have, <coughs> we have PayPal, we have Venmo, we have Cash App, and we have um, other options available. Just go to our website, www.askchurchjamaica.org, and it will be posted in the link that you'll have for this video. We are available on YouTube. Our YouTube channel is Acts Mission or sorry, Acts Church Jamaica. Um, that's YouTube, Acts Church Jamaica. And find us on Facebook, me. You are there already, some of you. So you are you are at Pastor.winston and you can forward that to others. Or you can find us on um, Instagram at Pastor Winston. No no dot in between Pastor and Winston. But again, I welcome you today. Today I want to talk briefly after we pray about something that I spoke, I think I spoke about some time back. <clears throat> I've done this many years, for many years, and a little while back I talked, I think I talked about it, and it has to do with living a guilt-free life. You see, many of us have challenges, you know, and we make mistakes, and we run into issues, and we run into all kinds of little nuances of life that causes us to um, slow down and begin to reflect on ourselves and say, hey, I can't do that because I'm not worthy. Many people that I find in Jamaica that I would ask if they are righteous people, if they have the righteousness of God, they will tell me, ah, <laughs> Um, face that she'd like to be here, um, they, would, they would tell me when I asked them, are you a righteous man or a righteous woman? They said, no, 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 I'm trying to be righteous. But you must realize, my friends, that the righteousness of God is a gift. It is not something you work on. It is not something you pray for. It is not something you have to work toward. The righteousness of God is a gift because the Bible tells us you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. It doesn't give you a caveat. It doesn't tell you you're the righteousness of God because you've done something unique or special or different. Well, yes, you have. You have believed in Jesus Christ. But there's something beyond that. And that is what? That is the fact that righteousness is bestowed upon you as a child of God. And the righteousness that you are is something that we lose perspective of when we run into situations with which we are confronted. 
We stop and we think, well, you know, <clears throat> I sinned last night. Oh, you know, I said so. I got angry last night. <clears throat> I got upset yesterday. I did something that I know God wouldn't like. So I know I can't be righteous and I know God isn't with me and I know this isn't going to work or that isn't going to work. And what happens to us is that we lose the sense of righteousness and lose the sense of authority. That is the authority we have in the earth. We can't pray because we are not righteous, because we missed the mark. We, and that's what sin is, by the way. The, 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 hamar, the hamartiano or hamarshana, however it's pronounced, you know, it, it is a missing of the mark. But the issue is that we, are, we feel condemned when we miss the mark. We feel that, we feel rather, <clears throat> that um, we can't step into God's righteousness anymore. We can't step into the authority of the believer anymore. We can't actually do what God has called us to do. But let's dispel those things this morning. I want us to read from 1 John chapter 2 and the first and second verses. 1 John chapter 2, first and second verses. <clears throat> By the way, before I read that, I want you to realize that I'm not focused on the coronavirus and SARS-CoV-2 this morning. Why? The reason is that you can't focus on the negative. You have to focus on the positive things of God. I can come and tell you, well, you know, well, it's here because of this and it's here because of that. I can tell you all the conspiracy theories behind why, and it's not a matter that I've not seen them, not heard them. What I've done, um, and I will tell you this, what I've done is that I get so much information from different people that are so irrelevant to the faith that I have. That is, I believe that God is a preserver of life. I believe that God is going to, and is right now doing it, protecting the people of God. I know all of this, so why am I going to focus on all these conspiracy writings and readings and all this stuff coming out of the woodwork? Every prophet, every apostle, or, or those that have named themselves so, have a word, have an insight, you know, have so many things. And the Apostle Paul corrected the Corinthian church. He says, you have too many apostles. He says, you have too many prophetic utterances. He says, you have too many tongues and interpretations. <clears throat> he said, slow down. He said, no more than two or three. But I see probably thousands or if not more putting out things that to me are not always so relevant. Everybody is having a prayer. Everybody is having a this or that. You better learn to pray for yourself. You better learn to prophesy over yourself. You better learn to do this. Now, I am not discounting the fact that they are valid prophecies. I am not discounting the fact that they are valid apostles and evangelists and prophets. All of that, they are, those are very credible. But I'm talking about that all of a sudden, you know, you see so many things and you have to watch it. Intercessors, you be very careful <clears throat> how you let yourselves be saturated with the world's thoughts because the enemy is very willing to put all kinds of thoughts out there through his minions and through his people that will thwart the, the flow of apostolic prayer and prophetic prayer and will uh, many times abort the plan of God and delay. When I say abort, it really means that it will delay the plan of God and it will have to occur in a subsequent season <clears throat> of our world. Amen. First John chapter 2 verse 1 says, My little children. Now, you already realize that he's, he's intimate with us. <clears throat> he's, right. he's talking with us from the perspective of we are his offspring. We are his people. My God. <laughs> Paula. <laughs> Paula be nice. <laughs> he says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye may not sin. <clears throat> no. He says, I write these things that you may not sin. So, wow. Do you realize that it's telling us that we don't have to sin? Whoa. Do you realize that the believer in Christ does not always have to sin? 
you know, incidentally, I noticed something um, since a few days ago, since I started. There is an algorithm change, it seems, on Facebook. And uh, they shut me down from posting into certain groups. You know, I can't post into too many groups, number one. And then, when I started, well, while we are live, I can't. And then, when we are not live, I can post into usually as many groups as I want to. But within the last few days, it has absolutely shut down. And they are not populating the groups or sending out the message of that be that I'm online to the people. And so pray for that, please. Again, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that you may not sin. So then we realize that sin is not something that is, um, that is required. Sin is not something that our nature has to always be involved in. We are now children of God. We are now people of God. And we can walk outside of an atmosphere of sin because you have a new nature and people may say well I can't live a sinless life because we choose to not live a sinless life we choose to do things inconsistent with the nature of God that is in us and unfortunately all of us are prone to that all of us fall short of the glory of God you know you fall short of the glory of God before you became a Christian after you become a Christian, you fall into the glory of God. Amen? And so the next part of the reading this morning says, And if any man sin, you have an advocate with the Father. If any man sin, you have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This is a remarkable expression, and it is a wonderful ministry of Jesus this morning. That is, no matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter how awful your thoughts and your attitude has been, you have an advocate, one that loves you, one that cares for you, an advocate with the Father. It seems as though his heart would break each time we have done something and we have not recognized that he's there to help us. That we don't really step into his umbrella of covering, that we don't say, Jesus, help me, Jesus, forgive me. <clears throat> it seems as though um, Jesus is sitting there and wondering, when will they recognize that I am their advocate? And then, <clears throat> you see, you and I, even our own hearts break, even our own attitude um, is challenged, our, our emotions are challenged, our whole being is challenged, when Christ does not have the opportunity to have the ascendancy and the rulership of our life, we begin to hurt. And then we remember in the midst of the sorrow and grief of our own life, Jesus is our advocate. He is our lawyer who lives forever, not only to make intercession for us, but he is there to appear before the Father on each one of our behalves. He's there to carry us, to lift us, to move us into a realm of defeat or from a realm of defeat into a realm of victory. From a realm of weakness to a realm of powerful authority. From a realm of being mediocre to a realm of being super abundant in Christ. Amen? And so the believer um, lifts up his voice and cries, Father, in the name of Jesus, forgive me. And then his great advocate, Christ himself, whispers, Father, lay not to their charge. I don't know who is feeling <clears throat> bad today, who is feeling under the weather today spiritually, who is feeling that God can't protect them, who is feeling that there is, or who has fear because they have not been the kind of Christian they, they have they have wanted to be, or they have not been um, the person that they have wanted to be in the church, and now they don't have the church to run into. They don't have the place um, to run to that they would normally run to, and so they, there's a sense of condemnation. But I want to tell you that the condemnation is only in your mind. It is something that comes from your enemy, your adversary, and there is no condemnation in Jesus Christ. When you turn back and you come back to him, 
There is no condemnation in Christ. Instead, there is a faithfulness to carry you and keep you and to sustain you, my God. You see, my friends, um, so everything, when you come to him like that, is wiped out and once more you can stand. You and I can stand before the Father without condemnation, without a sense of guilt, without a sense of anything negative that he's thinking about us because he has forgotten it. He has put it in history. <clears throat> so I don't have to focus on COVID-19. I don't have to focus on SARS-CoV-2. What I want to focus on is the power of God to keep me. Now I do what is necessary to keep myself in quarantine, if that's appropriate. I keep myself, you know, from, you know, running out and doing the things that would compromise my safety and my health. If God sends me out there, I'm going to go out there. If he sends me to someone, I'm going to go to that person because I know he protects me. Uh, it, but, but I don't have to focus on those kinds of things. What, I, what my focus ought to be is, is the Word of God and the power of God and the ability of Christ to keep me in those situations. How do I focus on Christ's ability to keep me in this season of life? I focus on it because I know the authority in which I walk. I know the, 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 the place that I am in Christ. I know that Christ protects me. I know that Christ is for me. So I don't allow the words of the world. I don't allow those false prophetic utterances to say how God is judging everybody. Because I want to point something out to you. God does not have to. To be frank with you, God doesn't have to judge you really. You have already judged yourself. You see, the world before the flood judged itself. The world before the flood caused a flood, yes, but the world, the world judged itself and the world was wanting. So yes, there are things that come and there are things that affect us, but do you really think that is God's intention to bring these things or is it only the only avenue that people have left up to the Lord? to bring a balance back into the body of Christ. I, I want to bring something to your attention. I was speaking with a young intercessor yesterday, um, Brother Kenroy. Uh, some of you know him. And as I was speaking with him on the phone, I guess he might have been in Kingston, I'm not sure where. But I was speaking with him and I was telling him about the church. Why do you think the church is empty? Why do you think, um, unlike any other situation in the world, that has occurred from the, the syphilis plague in the European stage back in the 1600s, you know, to the um, Spanish flu, uh, to the Ebola, uh, to cholera. All of these things that have transpired in the earth, nothing has had the effect of shutting down. Think about even SARS, the first, the first encounter with SARS before this last one. You know, think about this for a moment. That nothing has shut down the church. <clears throat> the church building, you know, people have gone to the building, people have prayed in the church, people have done things. This is the first time I believe in our recorded history that the church, the doors of the church have been closed. They have been closed to the congregate worship that we have become so accustomed to. I would, I, I would venture to say this. The Bible talks in the book of Ezekiel, you know, about what happens in the sanctuary and how the world and how the very church has been polluted and corrupted. And so I would want to venture um, and ask you a question, and I want you to ponder this for just a moment. Is God doing a little bit of house cleaning has he entered the sanctuaries so that the sanctuary, sanctuary of our heart can be clean? So when we return to the physical sanctuary of what we call the kirk or the church, um, when we return to the physical sanctuary, the physical sanctuary will be cleansed because our hearts have been cleansed. 
I wonder if the Word of God that says that the judgment begins in the house of God. I wonder if God has entered the church because he wants to clean up the entertainment philosophy of church. I wonder if God has <laughs> emptied the church because he wants to clean up the money-making philosophy of church. I wonder if God has emptied the church because he wants to clean up the mediocre spiritual atmosphere that exists in church. I wonder if God wants to clean up the attitude that we have that we can't speak about the Holy Spirit. Uh, I wonder if he wants to clean up the attitude we have of separation um, of denominations. I wonder, I wonder what God is doing to clean up the church. <clears throat> and by the way, when I say that, remember, I'm talking about the body of Christ. He wants to clean us up so that when we read that physical sanctuary, there is a holiness, not just a gifted righteousness, but there's a holiness that also goes with us. There's a holiness that also walks with us. Amen? And so I wonder what God is doing. Amen? I, I, I am rendering that as a position for you to consider this morning. You know, as I was pondering the things going on in the world, you know, th that, that kind of effervesced in my spirit. That kind of came up in my spirit. You see, I, I think he wants clean and pure hearts. I, I, I want you to consider something. Now, I, I, I'm going to talk about something. I don't understand. I don't dislike these people. I don't hate these people. As a matter of fact, my position is they have to answer to God for many things. But do you realize that today mega churches don't exist? Do you realize that today mega ministries really don't exist in the same way? <clears throat> Why? Because God has allowed some things to occur to bring to bring a correction to the body of Christ. Hmm? God has allowed some things to bring a restoration of something that was in the book of Acts. And that is a motto we have in Acts Mission in Jamaica is doing the first works of the gospel. <clears throat> that is doing the first works, my God. Let me see what Jessica just says. Renew our right spirit. <laughs> Woo! Jessica has gone right back to David. <clears throat> David saw. Renew a right spirit in the church, Lord God. But you see, the church is not the building. So the right spirit has to be renewed where? It has to be renewed in us. We have to be renewed. We have to reflect on who we are in Christ. We have to shut down the foolishness that we... It has hurt my heart. I, in, in talking with Ken Roy yesterday, <clears throat> um, last evening, I, I spoke with him about, you know, how my heart pains and my heart aches and my heart yearned, you know, for the 12 young people that God had put on my mind and put in my heart to bring them in apostolic fellowship. And no matter how I tried and no matter how I attempted to influence and encourage them, their thoughts were elsewhere. Their minds were elsewhere. Brother Kenroy said, well, it had to do with distractions. There are so many distractions in the world. And it is extremely frustrating to the men and women of God that really have a heart for the people and have a heart for the will of God. It is frustrating. We are not God. And so we don't walk it all on that, you know, hey, I'm going to get it done anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. <clears throat> we don't always walk like that. Sometimes we get into places of depression because we see what God has said. We know what God has said. And yet we don't see those things manifesting the way we want them to manifest. You see, my friends, the Lord Jesus Christ is called the righteous advocate because each one of us as a believer, you know, that, that one that has sinned has lost. 
He needs his righteous man or woman to come back home, to come back to the place where he needs to be. Who can go into the Father's presence and make an appeal for you and I, Jesus Christ, our advocate? And who can restore the lost joy and the sense of righteousness again? Jesus Christ. You see, the present ministry of Jesus is of infinite importance to each one of us. And we, no matter what we have done over the last few years as members of the body of Christ, erroneous or correct, what we can do now is turn our faces back to the altar. We can now get back to the place where Christ is indeed the hope of glory in us. So that when we re-enter that physical building, we are re-entering with the heart of God. You know, there's a song that we used to sing. It says, when the music fades and all you know, is slipped away, what shall we present to God? It has to be ourselves. And uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe, is calling us to reflection today. He's calling us to a sense of reflecting on our inner man, reflecting on our heart motives, reflecting on whether we want a few million dollars to buy a new aircraft, or we want a few million dollars to send it to missions, or we want a few million dollars to take care of the homeless people in our community, or we want a few million dollars to do the work of ministry, to empower others, you know, or do we want to consume it on ourselves? Do we want to have that million dollar mansion where we can live in a beautiful place, um, but the million dollar mansion is what we say we deserve as men and women of God? Now, you've got to understand where I'm coming from. Again, I say I don't hate anybody for what they do. I don't dislike anybody for what they do. But I've got to recognize by judging the fruit in the lives of those that are called men and women of God. I have to begin to reflect on what I ought to do. You know, what they do, they have to answer for. But what I do, I have to answer for. <clears throat> and so today, I'm believing God for finances, not for me, but to help those in the street. I'm believing God for finances, not because I want to have a big bank account, because I don't. And I don't expect to. Why? Because whatever comes my way is going to be used in the kingdom of God. It's going to be used to further, to put food on somebody's table, to, to, to allow us to share the message of the gospel with someone. That has to be our intention. I didn't come to Jamaica to build a mansion. I didn't come to Jamaica to build a church building that would house 10,000 people. I came to Jamaica to share the gospel of Jesus Christ and to ensure that people, when they came across our path, that path, that interaction would change their lives forever. My God, that's my heart. But many of us, we want to do something a little bit different. I, and, and, you know, you can't blame people sometimes because I remember when I got, my friends, I went to Rayma Bible College and there was a level of, we, we say a level of excellence that came out of Rayma in the sense that when I left Rayma, and that's where, you know, we, we, are, we are said to, to preach the prosperity gospel. So I went out and when I went out, I had to have a church that had air conditioning. I had to have a church that had carpeting on the floor. I had to have a church that had padded um, benches or padded chairs, padded seats. I had to have a church that had overhead projections. I had to have a church that had the best of the best of the best of the best. And then God got, got a hold of me. I went to Indonesia on a trip with my friend Gwen and Living Word Christian Fellowship out of Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. And when I went to Indonesia, I saw something that absolutely touched my heart and touched my mind and touched my life, touched my spirit. I saw people worshiping God by sitting on mats on the floor. 
I saw, one day I was in a church with the apostle of the ministry. He had like seven or eight churches, probably more now. But I sat there with this man and we were ministering and we were sitting on the ground. <laughs> and the power of God, I mean, I had not flowed like that in years. We sat and we ministered. One of the places that had, I mean, hundreds of kids that they ministered to was a building that had zinc around it and a zinc roof. You could hardly hear yourself, I would imagine, if rain was falling on the top. But there was a joy and a happiness as I went to Indonesia and I saw what was going on. I came back to Jamaica with a totally different philosophy because I said that church does not have to be what I have in my mind with all of these bells and whistles and this opulence. Church can be, and, and what happened was that a number of things began to happen where the power of God began to move in communities in the Kingston area, in some inner city communities. And one place we went and we said, we wanna start a church. The community leaders at dawn came out and others came out and painted an old structure so that we could go in there. We didn't have air conditioning, we didn't even have fans, we had some chairs, and we had some rudimentary things, but my God, Azusa Street had boxes and boards. When the power of God was, was released in Azusa Street, at the Azusa Street Revival, and then we, were, we had another place, another old building that they said, do this. And so that's what we did. When I did that, my God, the church came against me and said, no, we can't do it that way. We have to do it this way. We have to do it that way. We have to have the AC. We have to have that. We have to be comfortable. Well, now God has changed it. The Lord has changed it. The Lord has changed. Many of you don't know and didn't know. That's probably <clears throat> that's one of the reasons why I left Kingston. Because people didn't understand the fact that I was no longer moved by that prosperity gospel. I was no longer moved, you know, by having AC in church. I was no longer moved. All of those things are comfortable and nice. I was no longer moved. If we were able to do it, absolutely fine. Get get the AC, get the carpet, get the this, get the that. But if it was not available, we were still going to have church. <clears throat> if we were going to do it under, like over here in Galena, we did it under, under an almond tree. <laughs> we did it in a garage with a tent. We, we have had so many expressions of church since I've been in St. Mary. It has been phenomenal. People in the community know me as, as the guy that has church in the house. My God. My friends. My friends. You've got to realize that God is resetting. There is a resetting of the heart of the church. There is a resetting of the heart of worship. There is a resetting, my friends, of the heart of men to go after God. Forget about the bigness, you know, and believing for the big house and believing for the newest this and the newest that. Begin to pour your resources into God's kingdom because we can't take any of it with us. We can't use anything after we are out of this world. And so let's use it. Make full use of the resources that we have been granted. I'm doing that every day. I, have, I'm, I haven't asked anybody to do anything that I don't do. All of my resources. I said, I said once, you know, in my mind that I would put some things away, but all of my resources, whether it be finances or other things, all of my resources are given to God. Use them, Lord, as you wish. My God. My God. I like what Marsha just said. Minimize the earthy or earthly and maximize the supernatural. I love it. I love that statement. Minimize the earthly and maximize the supernatural. <clears throat> Maybe 
maybe um, 10, well, no, actually, maybe about 13 years ago, or more now, um, 13 years ago, it's 13 years, this is in our 13th year here, um, maybe 13 years ago, God was preparing me for today. <laughs> God was preparing my heart for today. God was preparing my life for the time when we could not just jump in to a big building. And I always wondered why he never allowed us to really have that big building and that big structure, you know, and have those hundreds of people. And uh, we did at first. But then I noticed that there was a shifting taking place. Uh, the lighting might be a little bit off now because of the sun, but the sun has risen. Amen? The sun has risen. Let the sun rise in your life. Um, let the sun come alive in you this morning. Let the sun truly shine in your life this morning. The few words that I've spoken to you this morning, it's now 6.39 by my time. Maybe your time zone might be a little bit different. Hmm? Maybe your time zone, it might be after 7. But yet the sun has arisen. <clears throat> If you notice, if I look into the sun, if you look out the window right now, everything has become hidden because of the brightness of the sun. The sun hides, as Marsha just said, get away from the earthly. The sun now um, makes the things of the earth pale in comparison to its brightness. My God. Let the sun rise in your life. Let the sun grab a hold of you. Let everything that you are and every gift that you have and everything that God has put in your life, make it available to the kingdom. Make it available to your local church. You know, that's what I meant when I, I decided to use the, God, the, 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 the motto for our ministry doing the first works of the gospel. Bringing together the resources that are available to us. My God. <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Jessica says, let the sun, S-O-N, shine in. <laughs> and by the way, Jessica, that's a song. <laughs> uh, let the sun shine. I, I, I can't sing, so. <laughs> Amen. But you see, Jesus is Lord of all of our lives. Let this day and days to come be a remolding or a resetting of the hearts and minds that's within each one of us. Let us enter the sanctuary as new, fresh, and anointed believers. Let us pray. Hallelujah. In an anamandu lobo shikar, yonder wo sedia. Mighty God, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Mighty God, mighty God. <clears throat> mighty God. Great and mighty God. You who hold the heavens, Father God, together. You who have created the worlds, and Father, you who have created all that is within. I thank you this morning for your people, and I thank you for the preservation of their lives. I thank you for the hedge, the mighty hedge of protection you have put around them. Um, those that are in New York City today, Lord God, I thank you for the preservation, Father God, of Nikki and her children. I thank you and her extended family, Lord God. I thank you for the preservation, Father, of Rosemary and her family. And those that we know in New York City, Father, I thank you, Lord God, this morning the blood of Jesus covers them. Across the United States, Father, in Kentucky and Ohio, and all the states, Lord God, where there is someone that cares for us, loves us, and cares for you, God, and loves you, we ask, Lord God, that the blood of Jesus cover them this morning. And across the world, Father, we thank you that there is a covering presence of the blood of the Lamb that keeps your people and preserves lives, Father. Father, we don't focus on sickness, for the Bible tells us in the Word of God 
that we speak those things that be not as though they were. Father, we speak faith. Faith speaks things that be not as though they already are, one translation says. So, Father, we speak healing. We speak health. Where there is no health, we speak health that comes from the majesty of God's kingdom. We speak healing that comes through the virtue of Christ. We speak, Lord God, strength that comes, Lord God, to Father, strengthen the feeble knees, Lord God. Uh, this morning, Father God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we speak like our Father those things that be not as though they have already occurred. You, God, know the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done. You, Lord, bring good things. You are not a God that brings bad. And then, Lord God, um, you cause us, Lord God, to be destroyed. But you are a God, Father God, that allows us in this these significantly negative situations to still walk with you and to walk in protection with you, Lord God. I thank you this morning, Father, for all who pray with me and for all who agree with me. I thank you, Lord God, for all who are preserved with us. I thank you, Father God, for the people around me. I thank you for Kenesha. I thank you for Sean. I thank you, Lord God, for the members of our ministry mission here in Jamaica. <clears throat> Father God, those who I've had the chance to speak with and those who I have not. Father, I thank you for preserving their lives this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Father in Jamaica, I thank you, Lord God, for standing down, Father, the course of this virus. I thank you, Father God, for limiting, Father, to whatever means, Lord God, limiting, Father, the multiplication process of this virus. Father, in the body of Christ, keep your people, Lord God. Keep and strengthen your church, Lord God. In the houses, Lord God, where we now meet, Father, keep and strengthen your people in the mighty name of Jesus. Mighty God, mighty God, mighty God, mighty God. Have a wonderful day, my friends, wherever you are. And you stay blessed in an atmosphere of protection in Jesus' name. Let the sun shine in. Amen.